Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Nigel Prince. I'm the director of Artist Mundi. Um, I'm a middle-aged man with a shaved head, a grizzly gray beard, clear framed spectacles, and I'm wearing a black crew neck sweater sitting against a mid gray, pale gray ground. Welcome to uh, today's talk this evening in the, in the UK, or it could be afternoon or, uh, or, uh, or, or early morning, wherever you, you're calling in from around the world. So really delighted that you're here to join us for this panel discussion uh, uh, at the table talks, this time with Manira Alsal, one of the artists we're working with on Artist Monday 10. At Artist Monday, we're really keen to set in motion dialogue and debate that helps us develop understanding of ourselves and each other, and in relationship to cultures that are both familiar to us and, and unfamiliar. So the at the table talks very much sit at the core of, 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 of our mission. Um, this evening, alongside uh, Manira, we're joined by Amak, Rachel and Sarah as the panelists. And for those of you who need the assistance, we have uh, Julie and Catherine who are doing the uh, BSL interpretation for us. They're operating as a tag team. And also in the menu bar on your Zoom screen across the bottom, there is um, uh, a, a tab for captioning if you need that. And it's Maria who's providing us with that, that uh, access service for, for this evening. So thanks again for joining us. I'm going to disappear from your screen and uh, we'll, we'll come back at the end. And I, first of all, I'd like to hand over to Manira to uh, introduce herself and set, set in motion a series of ideas and prompts based on the work that she has on display. And Rachel, Sarah and Mac will begin to join in. I'll see you all later. Thank you. Over to you, Manira. Thank you, Nigel. So my name is Munira, uh, Munira Salah in Arabic, and I have uh, brown curly hair, and my wall behind me is uh, ochre color, and I'm wearing a blue jacket, more or less green, blue. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm uh, one of the artists who is presenting their work this year at Artist Mundi. My works are at the National uh, Museum in Cardiff, right above the dinosaurs and uh, fossil and the amazing collection uh, at the National Museum. And um, when you enter the room, First of all, the first work you will encounter is the work of the artist Anwar Rushdi, who's a, an amazing work. And in the next room, you will encounter my work, my works whereby you would see um, a tri triangular form, which has 14 panels forming in a way like um, a, a triangular shape or a tent. In fact, it, it's a tent, uh, which is elevated about 14 or 20 centimeters off the floor. And it's uh, up on a dark green carpet. The panels are uh, more like olive green, and they're embroidered with the shapes and decorative items like um, uh, inspired from trees, from pine trees, from uh, olive trees. Um, when you are in the mountains of Lebanon, the higher you go, uh, the more you encounter the, the big sort of trees. And uh, on certain levels, you will encounter other types of trees. So I was very inspired from all these differences in, in heights and what kind of other trees get generated. Uh, when I drew the shapes on, on those uh, embroidered uh, textiles. Um, 
the textiles were embroidered uh, with the expertise and help of professional embroiderers in Lebanon who actually can embroider back, like front and back, as precise, as exact, as uh, you wouldn't know the difference between front and back. And uh, they usually embroider wedding dresses and scarves. And I'm so honored to work with these ladies whose names you could see also uh, I uh, wrote on the blue side panels. Now behind the, the triangular shape, you will see the semicircle. So in a way you are welcomed in that space as if it's a tent, but it remains open and actually it's at the same time dismantled. Um, I have been making tents, uh, which usually this uh, triangular shape is elevated, but now I we put it on the floor for various reasons. First of all, the ceiling of the museum cannot hold the weight. It's not too heavy, but still it would be not safe. And also, actually, since February uh, last year, when the earthquake happened, and in Lebanon, people felt it strongly and were very scared if it's going to come back or not, etc. You would, and what we saw happening in Turkey, especially in the epicenter and around in the region in Syria as well, it made you feel that nothing stands anymore. I mean, it's a feeling that we have not from only from that incident. But uh, from that moment on, I thought, OK, those tents I'm making, why should they stand? Um, and for now, still, it's quite, uh, I mean, I think it's quite balanced. But I also see myself in the future perhaps making shapes that are more leaning and so on. Uh, the side panels behind it are all blue color. Uh, every side panel uh, has been embroidered by a group of women uh, with whom I work, also uh, migrants who are in the Netherlands, as I myself divide myself, my life uh, between uh, uh, Lebanon and the Netherlands. And the last years, I've been lucky to meet amazing groups of women, uh, very diverse, who uh, are gathered by associations who work with refugees and migrants and uh, asylum seekers that are all brought together by local uh, women and with whom I worked on embroidering some side panels, for example. You see the first one on your left on the image is embroidered by Roya Oksu, who's Iranian woman with whom I worked previously also on some side panel uh, in a red tent. Uh, the first tent I made at that time was inspired from an um, uh, imperial tent, which was uh, from Qajar time. Uh, we have now uh, uh, Amak who could speak more precisely about uh, these issues. But for me as a Lebanese also, I, I was very inspired from that Iranian tent. Uh, usually it's for emperors, but for me, I wanted to make it for those who usually do not have the power and with them and for them, and especially for women. And usually every tent I make includes a story or a, a few stories of women I, I've uh, met uh, whose stories I believe are uh, important to be written and not to be forgotten forgotten. So that story here in this tent, uh, on the back side of these blue panels, which are embroidered each by a family, by family members. Also, my aunt has done the second one where you see green. The one on the left has been made with Daniela uh, and her mother and sister. And it kind of, she always tells me how it allows them to come together. So, uh, um, on the back side of these panels, we see uh, um, on gray sheets, uh, silk screened, a story uh, of a woman uh, who is Lebanese and who was a nurse actually uh, during the civil war days in Mustashfa al Barbir, which is not too far from uh, Al Mathaf, Al Mathaf, which is like, let's say, the demarcation line. Uh, at that time uh, that separated Beirut east from west. 
And on some of the panels I've written, I've painted actually words uh, which are from the lexicon of uh, Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah who compiled a list of words of love which I actually discovered through by reading Fatima al-Marnisi and her book uh, on love in Islamic countries. And at the end of the book, she collected those wor words again, she republished them and she translated them to French. Um, for, uh, so she had them in Arabic and in French. Um, and I'm very inspired from those words because it's at least 50 words. It's actually 100, but she has published 50 of them. And um, they, the notions can go from, let's say, nostalgia, uh, al-hanin, uh, al-alaqa, a relationship, so to speak, or even craziness, or even blood at them, or siba, uh, a sabwa, and many notions in love that can be uh, perhaps tender, but can be also very cruel, <laughs> so to speak. So that is what's very interesting for me about those words is that they contain so many different notions in love, uh, like longing, craziness, love, uh, in, on different levels. And um, behind the tent on the right and left, uh, there are uh, paintings, uh, some of them also inspired by Fatima al-Mernisi and other writers, but at the same time, very loosely. We can't say these are portraits or interpretations of books, but while I'd be reading books, I would, my imagination would go all over, including my own stories of trauma. There was a time where uh, we would be hearing a lot through friends of stories uh, of arrest, which uh, bring back also uh, personal, uh, um, you know, uh, incidents in our life. As Lebanese, uh, we I mean I've I was born in the war, and uh, luckily when I was teen aging, uh, the war was kind of coming to an end. But at the same time, uh, the south of Lebanon was still occupied till 2000. Uh, today, there is a, a, a high tension and wars, as you all may know. And um, we've shifted from a few years of the promise of peace, uh, which no one believed in. But uh, uh, let's say at least Beirut East-West opened one to another and uh, to slowly again uh, into a wave of car bombings and uh, threats uh, until today. So, I mean, no need to go in detail. <laughs> um, but so uh, the paintings, let's say, bring in a lot of personal memories, personal experiences, as well as a very playful ways to sparkle imagination based on some readings and uh, what's happening in the world, so to speak. At the same time, some of the paintings you see around them, for example, the yellow and green one, which is behind the tent, and Nigel had a great um, pick to choose that painting. Um, the colors are yellow and green. They, uh, in a way, are nicely tuned with the tent. Okay, the tent is green and blue because it's inspired also from Lebanon that uh, where the sea is blue and the mountains are green. Behind it are this green and yellow. Uh, and I, I don't know, I'm addicted to yellow. We have uh, on the side also opposite that drawings which I started to make in Lebanon around 2011-12 using a uh, lined uh, uh, paper, which is yellow and which is made in Lebanon. Now the, the work is, let's say, evolving or changing over the years where I'm using also A3 and they become a little bit more painterly, just like the paintings opposite. But originally it was all portraits of people on yellow paper because I used to uh, do research for my own work. I always do research and I write down notes. And in 
um, Marim Khayel, where my studio at that time was and where my house still is now, there's one uh, library, small library, where I go get my art supplies without it being, let's say, an art, uh, an art shop. <laughs> Uh, it's just like a few minutes walk and uh, the, this notebook is made in Lebanon. The quality of the paper is very good. It's among the few things that are still made in Lebanon and have preserved a good quality. And uh, as uh, yeah, we, we struggle to find things made in Lebanon or if you buy things which are import to make your art, usually they're so expensive and uh, it feels artificial or I don't know. So I used to uh, use that paper anyway for my work. And this is where I started to do drawings when the war in Syria had started. First of all, we didn't think it was a war. It was uh, the Arab uh, Spring, as it was called, uh, generating people to dare and go on the street and demonstrate. Uh, of course, people, some were against, some were for and demonstrating, but many, many young people, activists were very hopeful for a better future for us in the Arab world, where people would dare to say what they think about. And of course, as you know, it turned into something else. Um, but at that time, a lot of the young people came to live in on Marim Khayel, and I wanted to meet with them in a way to also um, break that wall be between Lebanese and Syrians and also to catch uh, the stories. Because as a child in the war myself, I wasn't able to write or to preserve any story. And I, I know that between my generation, generations younger, there's a there's a gap and there's a lot which we don't know about each others. Uh, um, so I thought it 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 was for me very important to uh, to meet people, write our conversations, and also in the talks we don't talk only about war. Or uh, at that time, it was really more also recording hope, so to speak, for a change and. Uh, talk to see what are people aspiring in at the same time what are they reading what do they drink what do they listen music love so the conversation would, would go also uh, broadly not just uh, not politics per se it was a it was this way that I thought it's like uh, recording mini histories and once put together they make a bigger story uh, at that time, also from Syria, many people left, but um, when you were in Syria, you wouldn't meet necessarily, but uh, when the revolution started, people went out, and also because of social media and so on, they would meet, and they would be meeting from different towns and cities like never before. So that was also particular, plus added to that the layer of people in Beirut. At that time, Beirut also had many Iraqis, uh, Lebanese, and the Lebanese themselves are very mixed because many of them, they leave escaping war or in search of better economical chances. Then they come back, they bring in with them their own, what they've learned from abroad. So the Lebanese themselves also are very diverse, so to speak, even though it's a small country. So uh, let's say this was also a way to capture this diversity that was being proposed in Beirut in our streets at that time. Um, of course, it, uh, you could say, yeah, it's also, um, it's a very big topic, but let's focus on that. I'm not going to go more in details for now. So yeah, so you have on one side the paintings, um, also around the paintings, I use decorative elements, which I get inspired. The more I research textile, the more I get inspired. Um, and for example, uh, uh, on the back side of the tent, you also have a wall, which we painted. And Melissa worked really hard on it with the people, technicians there to, uh, to layer it because I wanted to put coffee, uh, Turkish coffee, which we drink in, in Lebanon, we boil it. And so I wanted to put it on the wall and above it, there's a sign saying, al iman. 
So this work I made at a time where uh, I was thinking about uh, slogans and at the same time, uh, I'm someone who spends lots of time on the Corniche and where we, we go for the seaside promenade. And then a lot of times people drink a coffee there uh, from the, you know, shops to go, uh, Uncle Dick and so on. Uh, these are places where I love to also get my coffee or water. Uh, and then, but then most of the times people drink and throw it in the sea. So in a way, um, we also have uh, in the neighborhood where I grew up, uh, Zarif in Beirut, uh, uh, people used to write on the walls things like to encourage others not to throw things on the floor. And uh, you would also see this slogan uh, or this uh, expression, another uh, uh, al iman, which you can also consider as uh, you know, Muslim more or less. So you could consider it, it is actually coming from, uh, I mean, you would, you would read it in Muslim neighborhoods. And uh, I combined it with coffee uh, because coffee also cleans. Uh, I remember during the war once uh, someone uh, hurt his hand gravely, there was so much blood. And then he powered a lot of coffee to stop the blood but also in a way uh, coffee cleans so but for me it's also a critique to our society where there's nothing clean in lebanon uh, everyone throws the coffee cups on the streets there's no way to you know you really have to work with a few people to recycle upcycle usually things are thrown in the sea and it's really uh, not the cleanest place um, okay so i'm talking too much but this is to give you a general uh, uh, view on the this first exhibition space. On the back side, uh, there are words of love that are interpreted in embroideries. Um, and there is a, a magazine uh, where you can sit to read if you like. Uh, it's called NOAA, Not Only Arabic Magazine, whereby usually I invite editors and writers to think of a certain topic together. And the last one, uh, where I invited women uh, from different parts uh, of the Arab and let's say Islamic uh, uh, countries or neighborhoods, uh, even though they contain not only uh, Muslim people. <laughs> so I invited uh, women to, um, to speak about the, the revolutions that they have been through because in the Lebanese re uh, revolution, when all happened in 2019, the role of women was outstanding. And also because we really, our rights are bound to uh, religious laws as women. So also when you marry, when you divorce, when you inherit, when you, all these issues, when you die, when you're born are still uh, most of the times treated uh, according to a religion which is written on your, uh, identity card you if you want to change it or delete it you will have to go through some uh, 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 paperwork and then you might also have to face some consequences in some families if you do that so it's still very much like that um, uh, that's like more or less a general presentation of what you can see in the exhibition and I forgot to mention that, which is for me, it was the most important actually to be able to sing on that day uh, for the opening uh, with the Oasis One World uh, Schwar, Schwar Choir, uh, which was which is led by Laura and uh, founded by Tracy, and we have sang uh, the song of Ayman. Uh, who was with us, he wrote that song and the participants, uh, Ayub was a solist among other people. And um, I think it was so important that we stood there and we sang, uh, we sang for peace. I think it's really much needed these days. I remember we were singing up on, uh, on the first floor looking at the people 
And as we were singing, I just, I couldn't hold myself and I, and I cried. It was really, really touching and uh, important. Um, so uh, I'm so grateful to their participation in that, in on that opening day and the drawings uh, also I was able to meet with some of them and with other people whom I was introduced to when Letty you organized that with Helen and I drew fantastic people uh, to continue the stories which I had started to draw uh, in 2011. The work now is much more broad and I'm very happy about that because uh, since a few years when it became more and more difficult for us as a family to survive in Beirut and we've moved to the Netherlands while going back and forth all the time. Uh, but while being here, I've met with people from so many different backgrounds. And I thought if I'd only meet with one group, I'd be like acting, you know, by category and this is so wrong. I really opened up and I met with people from so many different backgrounds and I still do that. And we sit together, we write, uh, I write our conversations and I make a drawing uh, at the same time. So this, that's like the work uh, which is titled, I strongly believe in our right to be frivolous, which you can still see and uh, it's ongoing till now. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Manera. Sorry, I, oh, here we go. Was long. No, don't worry. My, um, my camera won't turn on for some reason, but maybe you can hear me. Hmm. Sarah or Amak, do you want to respond and then come back to me while I figure this out? Sure, not a problem. Um, Munira, that was so refreshing. And so, um, I don't know, you took me down memory lane um, through the trauma and the Uncle D coffee on the Corniche and um, all of these stories. And I'm just very grateful for, for this. Um, I never really thought of cramped coffee beans for cleaning wounds until you mentioned that. And then I had a flashback to my own childhood and I think it was this um scar I have here on my arm which uh self-inflicted by accident as a child <laughs> but um the neighbors and my mother used ground coffee beans to clean it because it was during the war and we didn't have um first aid um or red cross around so that being said <laughs> um um, to introduce myself, I am I am Sarah uh, Madi. I'm from Lebanon originally, uh, similar to Munira. Also grew up in that same uh, those same wars. Um, let's say I'm in my mid thirties. Um, brown skin, black hair. Um, I'm sitting in my office with my artificial plants to give some color. Um, to my environment, um, and I'm at Fordham University in the Bronx um, in New York. I'm an archaeologist and an anthropologist of religion, and I specifically study women um, and more so mothers who have met at healing shrines to deal with issues of fertility, infertility, um, healing the maternal body, the female body, and the infant uh, body, of course. Um, so that being said, <laughs> um, I... Um, I was really, um, it was really amazing to go back to that landscape you were describing and not only the, not only visually, but also smelling the pine trees and the cedar trees and imagining the olive groves and seeing the olive tree is one of, not one, my, my favorite tree um, ever because of the, the shape and the, the color and the smell. Um, it's a very Mediterranean um, landscape that I grew up in and I grew up to love, but also grew up to study eventually. And I wanted to add to your to your trees that, you know, they are not only part of our landscape, but 
they are also part of our sacred landscape, right? Um, the trees, especially the oak tree, all these big majestic trees, they've been transformed into shrines and um, where people just like stick religious figures into them, right? Or use them um, to, um, to gather around them, sort of like these women building communities around sacred trees, burning aromatic herbs, offering healing. Um, the trees are, are more than simple trees for, for us Mediterranean and, and Eastern Mediterranean um, cultures, right? Um, and I also really appreciate how you also allowed women into these imperial spaces, right? Because women have always gathered away from patriarchal society. We, we gathered in small caves and the shade of trees and trying to recreate our own spaces and trying to make our own communities of offering support and in terms of wet nurses, in terms of um, healers and midwives and matchmakers, right? Um, but we really deserve much more comfortable spaces. So thank you for allowing women these imperial tents um, to uh, for them to be present at. Um, they have always been the spiritual and the physical caretakers of, of their families, right? They've always offered healing. Um, still to this day, I mean, not only restricted to the Eastern Mediterranean region, but I, I teach... Um, an anthropology of religion class and where I'm also I'm always asking my students like where do we draw the line between magic science and religion right like when grandma makes you this special tea or special soup when you're sick is that magic or is it just medicine <laughs> right so um these these are the women that I've always imagined when I'm when I'm studying uh, my when I'm doing my research and looking at my uh, my ancient landscape but it was also a, a landscape that you so beautifully and effort, effortlessly um, just recreated and indoors. And you were able to do that indoors as well, which is even more amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to stop here and thank you again for this beautiful, beautiful um, work. I like hearing about um... You know, the the soup or the drink that your grandmother makes you when you're sick because thinking about the talismanic Monira we there was that project we did together years ago at Dain Nimr on Nidad on this exhibition that I curated on calligraphy and Monira was commissioned to make a new work for it which involved she embroidered all these tiny well objects of different kinds but those that really used were about using text and language in such a way as to have this apotropaic impact on the body. And these things were embroidered on this beautiful scroll. It's a lovely work. If, um, if anyone wants to see it, Monira can share images. Uh, but this sort of brings me back to a different phase of your practice. My name's Rachel Dedman. I'm a curator and a writer. I'm the Jamil curator of contemporary art from the Middle East at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And I'm a white woman in my 30s. I have shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and gold jewelry. And I'm sitting in my very messy study slash baby's nursery, but making strong use of Zoom's blur your background filter to um, <laughs> spare you all of this. It's lovely to hear Sarah's um, take on, on Monira's work. And thank you, Monira, for that very generous description and, and beautiful sort of evocation of the work, which I haven't yet seen, unfortunately, I can't wait to visit. Thinking about nature and trees and that, that space that, that Sarah brought to life, I guess I come to your work from the direction of textiles and embroidery. That's a particular area of interest and specialism of mine. Um, I work a lot with, with embroidery and, and thinking about uh, Tatris and um, its histories in the region, specifically in Palestine. But for me, that this your work is always in conversation with that sort of legacy of, of Tatris, of embroidery, in, in Bilad Hashem's, in this part of the Levant, this idea that, that historically embroidery was something totally practiced by women, by rural women, was about their connection to, to nature, to their everyday lives in agriculture, but more than that, operated as a sort of visual language 
that, that this was a shared language among women, one that meant they could express their, their character, their identity, their origins, and that what you wore, what you created for yourself could be read and understood and sort of passed by others. And then over the course of the 20th century, I mean, particularly in Palestine, given the urgency of the political context, but indeed elsewhere too, embroidery became associated, I think, really with resistance, with a politicization of craft that we see very much the, the sort of impact of or manifestations of today, and associated with resilience. And I'm really interested in how your work, Monira, is about bearing witness and sort of making space for testimony is about memory and sort of the, the telling of stories, but through the intimacy of, of textiles and through the intimacy of embroidery specifically. And there's something totally familiar about textiles. I think that's what I love about them um, in terms of both the kind of humble nature of clothing and the, the imperial Ottoman tent. And your work has spanned the gamut from the like imperial tent to the most humble kind of tent um, to the wedding tent to, you know, and that that structure is something you've really explored, I know. But there's whatever the context of that sort of historical form might be, there's something familiar and human about textiles. And I think for me, that's where that is really something at the core of the, the power of your works. And I'd love to talk more about. Amak, what do you... How do you respond to Monira's work based on your experience? Um, good evening, everyone. It's absolutely um, amazing after listening to Molina and Sarah and Rachel to join you here. Um, it's a great pleasure, Monira, to hear about your work because I had an absolute um, pleasure to see your opening and to be at um, Arts Monday, which is... Um, absolutely good now to know more details and the depth of your project and the layers of that. So to start with, my name is Amak, Amak Mahmoudian. Amak is a female Persian name, which means shelter. Um, I have a short, um, long, uh, short, actually black hair and my background is blurry, actually, because I am at the same as Rachel. I am in a very messy room. And um, with the echo, so sorry for the echo of the voice. Um, I am a visual artist and educator living in Bristol. Um, I completed my PhD in research-based photography in the um, University of South Wales and working with photography, videos, archives and drawings and paintings. Um, my work explores the presentation of gender, identity, displacement and exile. Uh, I live in exile myself in last 13 years, unfortunately. And um, the work and my work actually they are um, explores and they are practiced across different platforms such as installation, films and um, books. I have published two books, Shana's Name, which is related to ID photographs of female in Iran, and also Zanjir, which is related um, to the archival materials in Iran, and it's an imagined conversation between me and the Persian princess and memories who did live 156 years before me. Therefore, working with ID photographs and archival materials, although I really appreciate and admire the way we can all, although I am Persian, Rachel, you have different backgrounds, Sarah or Monira, but we are all sharing the same feeling and the same journey going and talking through this um, work and artistic pra practice because it is related to the world and the state which is within us and that is something which I really admire about your work Morina and what was really um, inspiring for me and it absolutely attracted me through the opening it was your drawings of those people because very often they were these ID um, information that I could receive and I could see and I could witness through the exhibition and it was this line of portrait of people to be identified to be seen but this identification and the process of that was quite 
gentle and slow and it was against all the stereotypes and perceptions that we all have because of the specific area we belong to or we are coming from. They are always perceptions and they are constructed identities. But what was really interesting in your show and the line of portrait, it was the construction and the drawings that you created. And it was absolutely opposite and in contrast with all those constructed identities and stereotypes. And I am interested about the process of creating something slow rather than the immediate response and that process of creating a space within. And it was the presentation of that. It was quite obvious in your tent because your tent is was open and being there, standing next to the tent, one could have this feeling actually the power is within within all of us in this room. And the safe place is within rather than created it outside. And this is something which I would love to hear more about your work. And I would love to have this conversation with you. Uh, Amak, uh... It's so nice to hear you, Sarah and Rachel, all of you. Um, can you hear me? Am I? Yes, okay. Um, Amak, I'm also very interested in, in your work uh, to know more about what you're doing because uh, I, I know you've also made portraits and uh, where, uh, very interesting what you mentioned, the slowness, the slow work. And maybe we could see uh, where in your work you, 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 you find that, uh, because I'm sure you also deal with it. And also maybe later Sarah and Rachel. With, with my work, actually, specifically with the first project I published in 2016, it was in response to how photography can function, how art can function, and what are the possibilities of art, and what are the limitations of art? Because we, there is so much that we can share, and they are sometimes the layers that they are, they stay concealed and hidden, and then you are trying to discover that through the conversation with your audience, with the viewers. And that is the way that you try to say how, for instance, for the project that I work on with the ID photographs, how photography functions in social, official, and also personal level. Um, the photographs, yes, I work with ID photographs. And I did work. Those photographs, they were related to Shenasname, the ID uh, identification letters of Iranian women in Iran. And that is the birth certificate which we carry all our life. And the photographs made for those specific booklets, which is the birth certificate, they need to go um, through some specific standards and they have to follow those standards. Otherwise, they will be rejected and you have to redo those photographs. Therefore, um, this project has started with very personal actually experience, Marina and Sarah and Rachel. Um, I will shortly, actually quite briefly explain that. I was waiting in a reception room holding Shana Sama of myself and my mother. And um, all of a sudden I had realized and I came across this realization that how we look similar in these ID photographs, despite all the differences between me and my mother, because of the ID photographs, we were melded into one being. And all of a sudden, it went beyond that. And I realized, actually, all Iranian women were made to look similar with this scarf without showing the hair. And um, then I started to collect these ID photographs. And beside that ID photograph, I started to co and collect the fingerprints of Iranian women, those people who um, agreed really kindly. They did agree to become part of the project. And it was all about, Shana Sama was about um, our religion, 
as you know, the perceptions, the stereotypes, the standards, the religious state, and the performative and constructed identity. And also it was about others and their understanding. Because although the photographs, they are really similar in this body of work, the fingerprints, they were so different. And that is part of our being and not any religion, not any power not any state could ever change that. And that fingerprints, it was really similar towards those lines that you had for your painting for me, because that is something which had been created by you. And as you said, with your imaginations and your connections with your past, reading those books or even having dialogues with those people. So although the work that I work on, it was the response of those Mm, quite formal ID photographs, but I could see the similarities between your drawings and those um, ID photographs. You're describing the your work, Amak, which which sounds really beautiful and striking. Reminds me of these two new works that Monira produced recently for an exhibition. I curated here in the UK called Material Power and Monira has has made these two but I know there's a larger series right some of these were were shown in Sharjah as well in the biennial maybe you've been working on this for a while this series of yours of portraits of women from the Arab world you mentioned Fatima Men Isi earlier she's one of them these portraits of women from the Arab world who maybe whose stories aren't well known who deserve to have to have a greater audience whose biographies are really extraordinary. And um, and what I love about them is that they're portraits in the most, um, sort of the most abstract sense. There's, there's something of their likeness, but you've also looked really at the etymology of their names and then created a kind of set of iconographies that relate to this. So as a Suleiman, the, the Egyptian rights activist who does totally amazing work. Aza means baby gazelle. So there are these little gazelles on the actual sort of embroidered tapestry. They feel like standards, like banners of the kind of thing you would hold aloft in protest or in a march, even though that's not really their intention because they're, they don't carry a slogan. They're not about explicitly stating a message, but rather about implicitly honoring and respecting these particular women and their and their stories um and if we're talking about making slow work or well, anything embroidered <laughs> is inherently slow because anyone who's ever done it knows it takes a really 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 long time and for me that's also partly where its power comes from especially when it's used in these contexts of a kind of honoring or respect or memorialization or of protest um in palestine embroidering during the the intifada the first intifada and, and the second there's this feeling that embroidery is the sumud the steadfastness and the very te extended temporality of all embroidery reflects that the fact that uh, resistance is not an event but a, but a process and um, for me that that extended temporality comes into this to all your work um, in that it's about sitting with these stories and bringing them to life slowly with respect and so on. And also what Sarah and Marina and also Rachel, what you, I am interested in about to hear more, maybe Sarah and uh, Monira can explore this um, actually aspects of conversation because as Rachel said, it's a meditation work when you are especially, and very often it happens in group, isn't it, Rachel? Because it's your research. It's a work that you work as a part of community, but at the same time, you have your individuality and you have your own signature and your personhood and personality to add to the work. But at the same time, it's collective. It is something which is quite, you are taking something and giving, which is absolutely beautiful. And it reminds me the Sufi dance, which you are taking and giving that energy back. But what was interesting about Sarah and Monira's conversation in particular, it is about um, 
what we give to these people, as you said, Sarah, it was bringing some memories to you about, for example, your grandmother, which is quite precious and is quite amazing. And that is something that I am quite interested in. I am interested in how art can act in this way, because unfortunately, sometimes the identity of people, their stories and your work is a storytelling. Monira and Sarah, you are having your research and you know the stories and Rachel is just curating the stories. So in a way, that is something which is related to the world. But sometimes those stories, those identities and those moments, unfortunately, they can be reduced because of the violence of the system, the power, or unfortunately, in many, many different places, including many places in Middle East because of the state and because of all the difficulties that people have. But how can art reflect on that? And how we can create something? How your creation, which is quite a safe place, is a tent. It's a place that you feel safe. You will go to hide yourself from the cold or darkness or white animals how art can um, reflect on these and how can reflect on the real identity and real stories of people and be against those violence that reducing those personhood and those stories um, i am interested in this if you can explore this a bit more between you and you guys you are amazing all I feel Sarah also has a lot of experience in your work. Uh, I'm very curious to know. Yeah, I've been I've been trying to dig out these stories for for a long time now. Stories of motherhood. Um, they're and and women, but I gravitate back to motherhood because of my work specifically on on mothers. Um, but these are stories that were silenced on different levels, right? So Amak, what you're saying about, yes, silenced by the state, by the official religion, by the patriarchal um, structure of a religion or a society or a community or whatever it is. But also um, maybe in response to that, even um, they were secret in nature. And um, in, in my work, um, <clears throat> I try to do some ethnographies. I try to collect some of these stories and talk to women who are still practicing um, these rituals at shrines and asking them, like, so what about that ritual? What do you what do you do there? And I'd get very shallow, like not even scratching the surface amount of information, um, because I was not initiated, right? Um, even though I'm a woman, even though I am from Lebanon, um, I'm not from the same region as them. And two, I don't share their same suffering. I don't share their same experience. Um, so you're only allowed to hear parts of the story um, unless you are more than 80, 90 percent part of part of them and their experience and their suffering. Right. So um, a lot of times trying to go to these shrines, trying to find a shrine was was really um, a challenge in, in itself. And if you ask a gentleman, just like stop and ask for directions because GPS doesn't work in rural places. Right. If you ask a gentleman, like, where's the shrine of Our Lady of Abundant Milk? He has no idea what you're talking about. <clears throat> Some gentleman would say, oh, maybe you should go talk to my sister and she lives around the corner, whatever. If you ask a woman, um, she would smile and say, oh, I'll tell you, I'll guide you. But then it takes her a few moments to realize that you're maybe asking to go because of, you know, some disease, some ailing, right? And then she would look at me and say, Oh, may, may your visit be accepted. May the Virgin heal you. Uh, may God respond to your prayer. Um, and I didn't always have the heart to tell them that I'm only going there for research, right? Um, 
But it was really interesting to see the dynamic of how much of our stories do we want to share with you anyway. So when I got a sense of how intimate these stories are and you know how personal they may be, even though they're public, but within their own private sp spheres, um, I just refrained from conducting any ethnographies and I just respected their um, right to plead ignorance whenever they wanted to um, and just went along with it. And it, it is part of doing archaeology because we are dealing with absences, right? We're dealing with traces of evidence. And sometimes we just have to accept this reality and this is what we have. And which brings me back, Amak, to your imaginary conversations with that princess. And I try to do those a lot and I would love to know more about um, that project of yours. Munira, can you say something about your experience of sitting or of working with these groups of women that you gather to embroider your works? Because exactly as Amak said, it is such a collective communal community practice and there's something about yeah the communing of women in around textiles around craft that enables a sort of letting a guard down or of you know leisure of chatting of of that sort of that intimacy that sarah describes yeah to you that maybe shares um, something with the shrine what's yeah. that experience like for example um you know, sometimes i was working with a group of ladies on uh on one of those projects and um, in a way uh, it's very interesting if it's not family members, if it's not, uh, if it's also people getting to meet each others, um, it allows conversations. And of course those conversations can go, you know, all directions. And um, within this calm uh, setting, you know, it could go all way, all directions, right? So I think um, it's very interesting when the group is homogene, right? Homogene. So, okay, you can expect some understanding, some basic uh, uh, things that people agree upon. But when you have also a group which perhaps on the surface look homogeneous, but in fact they're not, there it can be also very interesting. It's like when you're cooking together at the same time, you know, it's like when you're cooking together and then the conversation can go either way. And sometimes uh, there are moments also where uh, people are surprised, you know, um, by the differences, you know, in, in whether it's not like uh, ethnicity, but, uh, I mean, it can go all directions, all right? But what's very uh, interesting about it is when you are sitting, the act of embroidery is also allowing to accept those differences. And because you have a goal, you have to you have a goal to finish something you've started, right? So in a way, you will not um, you will not like quit everything because you are different. And I think this is the point where it can become very interesting because it can uh, make the group think, okay, now there is a more high, uh, you know, a more high goal for us. And I don't know why among women, when you're getting together, when you're embroidering, there's something also very um, sacred about it. Uh, I don't know why really, because maybe women have embroidered uh, clothing for their children because they have embroidered, for example, in Sperveri, uh, this bed tent, which is like the, the tent women embroidered in Rhodos. It's an island and they needed to embroider, let's say, uh, this huge, uh, beautiful tent around the, the nuptial bed where they were going to have the first encounter with a man they spend years doing it and they're very proud of it. And of course, as you were explaining, Rachel, some years back about the Palestinian abaya, how uh, you embroider this, uh, the, this side, right? But it could also change uh, as, um, for example, she would embroider the nuptial bed. But 
after a while she doesn't need it anymore and life goes on so what do you do with it it's a huge volume of highly delicate embroidered pieces where they would have for example on the top the peacock which is a symbol of fertility the peacock drinking which you see a lot in uh, in so many uh, cultures dating from uh, early uh, uh, Egyptian to Byzantine to Iranian and so on, uh, various places and times. Um, so what would they do with, with this after they've worked so hard on it? It's, it's so impressive to see, for example, a baby is born, then she would take a piece and make a dress out of it or maybe embellish her uh, house cushions by cutting pieces and so on. So these embroideries have a life in a life in a life in a life and it seems that when you are working on that it it has this value for yourself for the people you're working uh, uh on it you know to achieve it which which is much higher than what it might maybe be just like a pillow or whatever but I don't know why, it kind of carries the house or it brings it together. And it's something you can give to from generation to the other. At the same time, it's fragile because, you know, it's textile. It can be eaten by uh, those flying uh, let. <laughs> so you have to also know how to maintain it and so on. And... As a counter story, I mean, uh, my my grandma, she really, uh, uh, for her was so important. For example, it, if someone marries in the family, you have to have like a Persian carpet or uh, to gift, you know, <laughs> or something like from that value. And I, I think it's my interpretation. I think uh, my mother, she rebelled on these things. It was her way to to be different. It's also quite much her generation, I think, but especially her, that uh, she would rather have simple things, you know. Um, and uh, so it depends on the people, on the person, but there is this value most of the times where um, when you embroider, uh, it has a soul to it, you know, the soul that it stays in it is rather the aim than even it's not even about the finished piece i think it's something much beyond of that and when you're sitting as a group doing that you're like multiplying it because everyone has that feeling and it's coming together and when we're sitting with a group of women each one from a different background each one brings in her uh, you know the afghanis they are perfectionists oh my god for example uh, Kamar, she's one of the outstanding women embroidery, embroidering whom I met in the Netherlands. And she'd always be saying, oh, it's not good enough. But when I see it, it's like so beautiful, so fantastic. And each one of them has that. And also you could recognize uh, the hand uh, signature, you know. So um, so it is, it is really... Uh, almost like painting it, it's not almost it is painting i think because the needle is a brush for every woman to embroider her pieces and like the way i embroider is very messy uh you could see i mean i'm a i'm a rather an artist not like uh so you could see uh <laughs> and in a way i i like that and uh it is i mean i have to accept it right but this is why coming together makes it so powerful because each one adds their own way to do it, uh, which would give to the piece a very fresh outcome, I think. Uh, of course, some pieces, uh, it depends, but I mean, in general, that, that's how, how I, I would see it. Uh, um, I, uh, yeah, I love the way I love the way you describe it with your body language because with the needle, even when there is a scar or when there is a wound, it was a wound. They use the needle to heal it and to stop it off bleeding. And yeah. I think it's maybe it's the act of, of course, it is similar to painting. It is similar to that 
but maybe it's just the act of creating the armor together of yeah. protection. It feels because even in these, um, they are these feelings that I make it for you and it will protect you or even, and many of us, we might have something. It doesn't matter where we are from, but we might have something needed from our grandmothers or from our, and we cannot, we keep it for the next generation or even if we don't decide to become parents, we keep it for our sister or our friend because this is a feeling that there is a soul, there is a protection in that and I cannot let it go. I need to protect it too. And um, that was quite... It's true. It's really all about that. In your I... world, especially with those words. And also the offering, because, I mean, uh, yeah, it's about sharing as well. And, and as you say, uh, it has something beyond of what it is. <laughs> but yeah, Rachel just mentioned it was a sign of resistance also, right? But it was probably also a, a sign for every woman to, to say, I exist, you know, I exist through doing that. And when you have, for example, uh, in my memory, I don't know if my memory is, is perfect, but in my memory, when my grandma used to be invited to a wedding or a fiancé in Damascus, she would have to do the dress on her own. My aunt also, she, I witnessed how she uh, embroidered and filled with a lot of yet uh, her own dress for her own fiancé and wedding and they were so proud of it and if you think of it it's like cooking something that takes you so long and then you know you wear it once <laughs> but then you keep it and it's about the memory of it sharing it giving it to your daughter to your neighbor to someone you love uh, as Amak said uh, some women do not want to have children but then they would still have someone to give it to so it's about passing on, uh, passing on as well. Yeah, this intergenerational care and love that so mirrors oral traditions and that storytelling that your work captures that we've talked about, I think is, is really beautiful. And at the core of all these ideas, the nature that, that Sarah was talking about, these sort of portraits of women, these feminist spaces effectively that you're forging in a very soft and natural way. I like that we came back now at the end to talismans and grandmothers. They feel like <laughs> two totems in this whole conversation. I think sadly we have to draw to a close and um, invite Nigel back in to say some final remarks. Sarah, do you have anything to add before we do that? Um. I would just like to emphasize the this generational and ancestral knowledge of women that was rarely ever written. And this is why I struggle in my work to find women in history and in archaeology. Um, but it's also something very charming to see that, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to write many of our histories and achievements. Um, they've been written for us. We've been silenced through them. Um, but we can still see them through these, these beautiful textiles, pieces of art, rituals, um, and so on. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Nigel, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah, Rachel, Minir, and, and, and Mac for, 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 for the conversation, for sharing those stories. And, I mean, many things strike me not only in terms of the spaces that Manira creates through um, with, within the making and how they become the vehicles or the vessels to hold the stories, but also how those stories through the very making themselves through the process, the, the objects that, that, that are made become the embody, become to embody, become the record, become the witness, become the, um, the document of, uh, of 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 those that coming together. I was particularly struck by that one phrase that by coming together we are even more powerful. And I mean, certainly, uh, given the dark times we're living in, then uh, 
that 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 is something that we would uh, we would hope we can return to and to to hold on to uh, collectively and together. I think. So thanks again to to, to you all for 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 the for the conversation uh, this evening. It's been a very rich and rewarding one, and one like all good conversations that would continue to happen around the table uh, for long 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 into the night. Um, thanks also to um, to Julia and Catherine and uh, Maria for the uh, captioning and the and the signing for this evening, and behind the scenes to to the Artist Monday team, uh, Letty and and Jane and uh, and and and, and uh, Kathy too. So thank you all, listening and, and and watching at home or at work or on the bus or wherever you may be in the world. Please do join. Join us again. Keep a lookout on our website for news of the uh, other forthcoming talks. The next one is with uh, Naomi Rincon Galado, and that is taking place at 7 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time on the 29th of November. So please do um, keep an eye out on that and sign up because collectively these seven conversations are very rich and help expand all the, all the ideas that that are that are there. In, um, embodied in, in the work that's on display in the various venues ar around Wales by, by the seven artists we're working with. So thanks again to Sarah, to Rachel, to Amak, and of course to Manira. and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Nigel.